Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Please be seated. And I'll turn my sermon over so I read it right side up. (laughs) So you may not know this about me. In fact, you probably don't know this about me. But I actually have a soft spot for the Marvel comic-based Thor movies. You seen those? Kind of weird, right? The priest likes movies about a comic book version of a Norse god who kicks butt and takes names. (laughs) But there you have it. We are who we are, even priests. So why? What's the attraction here? Well, as I thought about this this week, I came up with a couple things that stood out. I mean, first of all, lots of things blow up in Thor movies. I kind of like it when things blow up. (laughs) There are swords, and of course there's Thor's hammer, which can break anything. That's pretty cool. And I think Loki, Thor's near-do-well brother, is also entertaining. Maybe this is because I have brothers, and it's easier for me just to imagine one of them as Loki. <laughs> but you know the thing, the thing that I think the Thor movies do really well, that I actually really like, is, is they tell me who the heroes are and who the heroes most definitely are not. I mean, life has lots of ambiguity, doesn't it? I don't need that in my movies. <laughs> In Thor movies, the heroes often wear capes. And the monsters, well, they are evil, and they look ugly, and they have scary laughs. (laughs) Not only that, but no matter how bad things look in the movie, I know that by the end, Thor and his friends will have mastered whatever problem they're facing. And there's a certain comfort in that when I sit down to watch a movie. But it's fun... As fun as the Thor movies are, or any superhero movie that kind of has the same plot arc, so to speak, well, this is not real life or real heroism, is it? I mean, the heroes you and I meet, well, they don't have a universally agreed upon cape and tights-centered dress code. (laughs) And the villains, though this would be very convenient if it was otherwise, the villains do not necessarily have a scary laugh. You imagine, that would be nice if you just knew who the bad people were in life by how they laughed. You just try to tell a joke and see what happens. <laughs> but, you know, as I thought this through, the real difference, the key difference isn't actually, isn't actually really the dress code or the laugh. Or The real difference is deeper. And I think the real difference between Thor and his friends and Asgard and, and real heroes is that real heroes have no inkling that in the end, everything will be okay. But still, they choose to be faithful to the responsibilities they have taken on. You see, real heroes really risk all they have, and they don't have an all-powerful hammer to fix it. And they're faithful to their noble purpose, and they do all that with no assurances that everything will turn out okay, or that they can handle it, or that order will be restored by time the metaphorical credits roll in their life. Real heroes, real heroes are men like Maximilian Kolbe. He's the guy in the far, I don't know, I can't really call it left or right, the far back lower corner on this side of the church in the icon wall, he's the one wearing a concentration camp uniform. It's hard to know where to start with his story. Maybe a few minutes, a few moments will will capture his heroic faithfulness for us. Now, first of all, Maximilian was working outside his home country of Poland when the Nazis invaded it at the beginning of World War II. But instead of doing what, what I would do, or probably many of us would do, which is decide not to go back there, he went home because that's where his people were. Secondly, the monastic community he founded there actually sheltered 4,500 Poles and Jews in the immediate aftermath of Poland's defeat, a time of great violence against them. And then when the Nazis got tired of this, and they did, and they sent Maximilian to the Auschwitz concentration camp, well, he was faithful there to his ministry as a priest. 
that you smuggled bread and wine to celebrate illegal communion services for the prisoners. He tended those who were sick and who had been tortured. And then finally, on August 14, 1941, Maximilian volunteered himself, put his hand up to be executed in the place of a younger man with a family who had been singled out for an act of collective punishment. Friends, Maximilian was a heroic, faithful Christian minister to the end, even an evil end in an evil place. And not only that, when when he died, there there was no silver lining for him to think about, oh, maybe I'll be famous someday. Maybe I'll be on the wall at Church of the Epiphany. (laughs) He had no way of knowing that his action would much less be remembered or celebrated. For all Maximilian knew, in August 14, 1941, Hitler's 1,000-year Reich, his 1,000-year kingdom, was real. And his sacrifice would have no lasting impact of any earthly kind. Friends, Maximilian's a real hero. His life and his death is far more heroic than anything Thor has ever done in the comic books. And what makes him heroic is particularly his faithfulness. His faithfulness to his calling, even in the face of an evil death. In short, I'm convinced he is someone who did what Hebrews 3 suggests. This is page 1002 in the Blue Bibles, if you'd like to turn there. Maximilian is someone who did what Hebrews 3 suggests. He considered Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. And he not only considered Jesus, he practiced the same sort of faithfulness that Jesus practiced in the place his life took him. Just as Jesus was faithful to death. And as you heard Hebrews 3 this morning, did you notice? Did you notice how much this little passage focuses specifically on Jesus' faithfulness? This actually comes up twice in, in these short six verses. Look at verse 2, where it says, Consider Jesus, consider Jesus who was faithful to him who appointed him. Faithful to God is what it's saying. And then kind of like a bookend at the end, verse 6, it says, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. Now, interpretive tip from me to you this morning, and I was heartened, I was in one of our Sunday school classes, um, and this was also touched on there, but concepts in Scripture that come up twice in short order, well, they're worth paying attention to. It's like the author taking a flag and waving it and saying, look here. So let's look here this morning. Why do we consider Jesus, and particularly, why do we consider Jesus' faithfulness in particular as we live our Christian lives today? Well, of course, part of the reason, maybe even the most obvious part, is there never really is a bad time to consider what Jesus has done for us by offering his life for our sins on the cross. As I said last week, our wonder is always an appropriate response to Jesus and what he has done for us. But Hebrews Hebrews is pointing to Jesus' faithfulness here, not only as a thing to ponder, but also as a thing we as Christians are called to, in fact, must practice ourselves. We get a hint of this in verse 6 where it says, and we are his house, we're Jesus' house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. In other words, it's saying Jesus is faithful to his calling, and we are in the house of Jesus, in the family of Jesus. House there doesn't mean a four-sided structure with a roof. It means a, a family, a community. We're in the family of Jesus. If we are faithful to him, if we hold fast in our hope. Now, practically, though, what's that look like? What does that sort of faithfulness look like? We have lots of examples in Scripture and and in the church. We have Maximilian's example of faithfulness, faithfulness even in a concentration camp. We, of course, have Jesus' example of faithfulness, faithfulness even 
to the cross. We even have another example, kind of a negative example, in our gospel reading this morning from Mark 10 of, of faithfulness that doesn't quite get there. Jesus is approached by this rich young man, rich young ruler he's often called, and he wants to follow him. And Jesus says, okay. He says, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. He's saying, you want to follow me, this is what it looks like for you. Those are all high bars, right? Faithfulness in the concentration camp, faithfulness to the cross, faithfulness in the face of giving up everything. And while any or all of us may be called to that level of faithfulness, I do think there's a bit of, I don't know if I quite want to call it good news, maybe comforting news, in that I think those examples are towards an extreme that most of us will live our lives without seeing. You know, thanks be to God for that, right? I'm not sure I could pass the rich young ruler test if it was asked of me right here, right now, this morning. I want to say, what about my kids? What about my wife? What about our attempts to prepare for the future? I'm even much less sure I could pass the Maximilian test this morning if that was asked of me. But what Hebrews 3 reminds us, and really the whole book of Hebrews reminds us, is there is an everyday faithfulness as well that all Christians are called to. The faithfulness of holding fast to our faith in Jesus throughout our entire lives. And everyday faithfulness looks different for each of us, just as all our lives look different. But there are some common characteristics I'd like to talk about this morning. And first is just simply this. Our faithfulness has to start with Christ's faithfulness. There is no other place to start except with him. We start, we always must start as Christians by looking at Jesus, considering Jesus as Hebrews 3 challenges us. To put it another way, friends, we are not most of us, and I'm not going to identify who here, we are not most of us heroes, but we have a hero. And our own faithfulness keeps, begins by keeping Jesus at the forefront of our minds. So friends, in our journey of faithfulness, many of us, most of us are not heroes, but we have a hero. Secondly, secondly, friends, faithfulness is not just something that we feel or something we think about. It's actually something we have to do in our lives. It's about how we live our lives. It's about the choices we make every day. Friends, do our actions honor God and his commandments? Well, that is faithfulness. Do we consider Jesus? Do we follow his example? Do we listen to what he taught? Well, that's faithfulness. Or are we just thinking theological thoughts and feeling religious feelings? Not that thoughts and feelings are bad. They can be very good, but they are not enough for the faithfulness we are called to as followers of Jesus. Just like it's not enough to to feel love for a spouse or a family member or think love for them, but not actually be willing to do anything about it. So our faithfulness, it can't just be something we feel or something we think. It has to be something we do. And we have a picture of what that sort of life looks like very clearly for us in Scripture. The third thing is, is being faithful Christians is not something we do, we do alone, that we do in isolation. It's something we do together as a church, as the body of Christ. Friends, we probably live in the most lone rangery culture there's ever been, where personal freedom and independence Well, it gets prioritized over almost everything else in our lives. But Christian faithfulness as a baseline involves being connected to other Christians. And not just the other Christians we like, and not just informally when it helps us, but if I can borrow a word from my Presbyterian friends, covenantally, because we have the same Lord 
and we are part of the same body, and we have actually been bound together in a way that is outside our power and control, but it is our responsibility to live within. Being a consistent attender at your small group or Bible study is this sort of faithfulness. Coming here on Sunday morning is faithfulness. Finally, faithfulness means means preserving, persevering in our commitments to Jesus and to each other our whole life. No matter the cost or the utility of being a Christian for us in any given moment. This is actually, actually a point that the book of Hebrews, it makes repeatedly. I would say if there's one thing the book of Hebrews is about, it is saying, it is saying to Christians in an uncomfortable situation, persevere in the commitments you have made. Friends, it is tempting. It's tempting to let our inward and outward faithfulness to Jesus rise and fall, depending on what else is happening in our lives. It is tempting for our faithfulness for instance, to fall when being a Christian isn't going to win us any awards in our culture. And it's tempting. It's tempting for our faithfulness to fall when it requires some sort of great sacrifice, whether that is is of time or money or relationship or even extreme cases like, like Jesus or Maximilian or the rich young ruler. It's tempting then to just take the pass. I suspect all of us have felt this sort of temptation from time to time in our walk as Christians. I know I have. But friends, Hebrews reminds us, it encourages us to stay the course, to consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession who was faithful. Hebrews reminds us that faithfulness, well, it's something we do. It's not just something we feel or we believe. And that we do it together as part of a body, as part of the body of Christ. If you're part of Epiphany, as part of this body. And that faithfulness, well, it requires persevering, no matter where our lives take us. Friends, as followers of Jesus, we've received a great grace. We have been made part of God's people, part of his part of his family part of his house, if indeed, Hebrews says, we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in, in our hope, which is Jesus Christ alone. So let's be faithful followers, not just in our believing, but in our doing. That's the quiet kind of daily heroism that all of us are called to as Christians. And with apologies to mighty Thor, who no doubt would wish it was otherwise, to practice this faithfulness, we don't even need to wear a cape. Amen.